Hello and welcome to the Llama podcast, where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. I'm Peter Bowes and Llama is our acronym for Live Long and Master Aging. Today my guest is Asim Malhotra, a National Health Service doctor from the UK, a consultant cardiologist and an outspoken campaigner over the excessive use of sugar. Dr Malhotra is also a writer and a filmmaker. His latest documentary, The Big Fat Fix, exposes some of the myths, the misinformation behind our understanding of sugar, fat and exercise. It also suggests some solutions, some fixes to the global obesity epidemic. Asim Malhotra, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Peter. Pleasure to be here. For our, let's say, global audience, just tell us about your job in the UK as an NHS doctor, as a National Health Service doctor. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm a cardiologist, so I, I trained in interventional cardiology. So what that basically involves is treating people who have heart disease through keyhole surgery, primarily, something called stenting which is used very effectively uh, as, a, as a lifesaver for people who are suffering acute heart attacks, but also is, is used in treating people who have what we call stable coronary artery disease. So my job, my role is primarily working with patients across who, who have heart disease or who are, um, you know, potentially being diagnosed with heart disease. In the last few years, I've kind of followed a slightly different path away from conventional cardiology, which I still do. But, you know, there, there are much bigger issues around uh, heart disease and, and, and treating and preventing it. Let's go back a little bit. Why did you become a doctor? Ah, that's a very good question. <laughs> I think there are a number of reasons behind that, uh, Peter. I think first and foremost, there was almost certainly an influence from uh, my parents who are both now retired GPs. So I grew up in a, a doctor's household, but I was always interested in the human body and biology and science. And when I went to medical school, I was particularly interested in the heart and as an organ and looking around and being very much aware that heart disease is the biggest killer in the Western world. So um, I wanted to kind of do my bit uh, to try and uh, contribute to reducing that burden. And did you think about the issue of longevity or was it more the science and, and the practicality of, of, of being a doctor and, and curing diseases that you focused on in those early days? You know, it's very interesting. I very much followed a conventional you know, the diagnose and treat model of healthcare, which is which is what we have at the moment, which, you know, we'll talk about, which which needs to change, but very much traditional, yeah, absolutely. The the understanding how the, the heart works, how, you know, diseases affect the heart, and then those treatments. So for me, that's where most of, most of my basic training came from. And medicine itself is, is fascinating because a lot of the time, as I teach my medical students, it's like, you know, it's about solving puzzles. And I, I like to solve puzzles because you have a patient that comes to you and, and you have to try and get the diagnosis from, you know, from taking the history, listening to what the patient has to say, get clues from that, and then use appropriate investigations to, to reach your kind of conclusion or diagnosis. So that's where pretty much where I've started. And where did you train? And I assume or from what you've already said that it was quite a, a conventional kind of training to become a doctor. Yeah, so I trained in Edinburgh. Um, I went to, I was always fascinated with Edinburgh. It was a you know, famous medical school. But also when I was a teenager, I read a lot of um, Sherlock Holmes. Mm. And uh, what's interesting is, and many people don't know this, Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote Sherlock Holmes, actually was a, a doctor that graduated from Edinburgh Medical School. And he modeled Sherlock Holmes on one of his professors. And that's where the kind of solving puzzles came from in a way, because uh, as you probably know, Sherlock Holmes's byline is when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And in fact, that's exactly the same sort of mentality we use when we're trying to make diagnosis in medicine. And that leads me on to where I've kind of come on my journey since then, because I think we've, we've realized that we've got quite a lot of things wrong in terms of the origins around diet and heart disease, etc. So yeah, and you, you have come on quite a journey. <laughs> uh, was there, I'm curious, was there a, an epiphany at, at some point? Did a light bulb go on in, in your mind that made you think, actually, we're getting all of this wrong? Yeah, I mean, it was it was partially a gradual process with one probably major 
moment that I experienced that made me really kind of uh, started me on my journey to of, of kind of discovery and more exploration and asking questions where I hadn't asked questions before. On one side, Peter, you know, I graduated in, from medical school in 2001 and worked as a, as a junior doctor in very busy and, and excellent training departments in Scotland at the very beginning. And what I'd noticed over my career, certainly over a period of 10 years, is just viscerally feeling that there was more and more strain and pressure on the system. More people coming in with what we call multiple conditions of chronic disease as they were getting into middle age, more obesity. And we felt this, I could feel it, and my colleagues could feel it, something wasn't quite right. So we felt there was more pressure on the system. So part of my journey was, you know, this is not sustainable. So we have to, what are we doing wrong here? Can we do things better? But in terms of my journey around the obesity and sugar campaign, the moment came to me several years ago when I was um, woke up in the middle of the night as a cardiology registrar, resident on call, three in the morning, patient comes in with a heart attack, chap in his 50s, treat him, you know, quite quickly and effectively, you know, restore blood supply to the heart muscle. He's fine. Next morning, I'm doing the ward round. And I'm giving my usual advice to the patients. We've put them on a cocktail of medications. We usually put people on four or five meds. And I'm telling him he must take all these pills. And then I talk to him about the fact that he should stop smoking because he was, if I remember correctly, he was a smoker. And then I get onto the issue about healthy diet. And interesting at that point, you know, it was just basic low fat junk food. You should avoid that kind of stuff. And um, as I'm telling him, you know, that he needs to follow a healthy diet, he actually gets served a burger and chips. Mm. And he says to me, Doc, how do you expect me to change my lifestyle when you're giving me the same crap that brought, probably brought me in here in the first place? And, you know, for me, I thought, well, yeah, this is, there's something wrong here because I myself actually have always been a big foodie. You know, I like to cook and I like to eat good food. And, you know, I, I'd also been very much aware that the hostile food environment wasn't conducive to good, healthy food, neither for the staff or for patients. So at that point, I remember thinking about it and reflected on the fact that Jamie Oliver had done a lot of work highlighting the importance of improving school dinners, especially with child obesity in the UK that was rising. And I thought, you know, what would be a good idea is if he could get involved in the campaign around hospital food. So one lunchtime after this happened, through a friend, I got an email of, of his PA and, and just sent an email to him just saying, you know, I'm a cardiologist working in this hospital. And it's actually Harefield Hospital, which is a, a well-known hospital in London. Just an email I wrote basically saying, you know, I, I think you've done a great job with, with school dinners. Can you do something about hospital food? And about six weeks later, I got a reply basically saying, you know, Jamie would love to meet you. Would you like to come to, to meet him at his office for dinner? And basically, you know, I went there, met him, you know, he's a fantastic guy, very passionate. And, and with other doctors, we had a very interesting discussion. I then ended up writing a, a commentary for The Observer, which was a, a front page comment piece, which appeared a few months later about this issue, saying, I'm a doctor, a cardiologist, we're serving junk food to our patients. There's something wrong here and we need to, you know, and that for me is where things started. Did you, you essentially had to re-educate yourself or at least fill in the gaps that were created during your initial education as, as a doctor? Because I assume you didn't learn much about common sense nutrition. Peter, you're absolutely right. In fact, you know, reflecting back and I've spoken to some of my friends who I graduated with as well, not just at my own medical school, but other, other medical schools. You know, I don't remember getting a single lecture on the impact of nutrition, lifestyle, and health. You know, there were, there were public health lectures about impact of smoking reduction, probably having the biggest impact on reducing death rates from heart disease in the last 30 years or so. But there was nothing about nutrition and, and lifestyle. And it was much later on, you're absolutely right, in the last few years, I started looking at research myself in terms of nutrition research, impact of nutrition on heart disease, etc., and realizing that the, what you eat and stress and, and, and exercise and probably 80% of all cardiovascular diseases is, is through lifestyle, which is quite extraordinary. And not only in these factors contributing to development of heart disease, but actually using lifestyle as a treatment as well, much more effective than medications. And for me, one, once I had that realization, that's kind of where I continued on my sort of campaign that this, this we need a complete, you know, cultural shift. We really need a health revolution. Revolution is probably the appropriate word because you are just one of, of many, many doctors, of course. And, and if you assume that most doctors, not only in the UK, but probably around the world, certainly in the developed world, are in the same boat as, as you were in terms of that lack of education. Sure. What hope do the rest of us have? No. 
Peter, you're correct. Absolutely correct. So I think we need to educate ourselves as a profession. We need to start in medical school, change the mindset, change the teaching a little bit, shift it more towards sort of lifestyle interventions. But unle- yeah, unless we do that, unless we go to the root of it and, you know, medical school, postgraduate training, then, you know, we're going to continue with the same model of healthcare, which is failing the public and it's failing people's health. We've done, listen, we've done some great things in medicine, especially when it comes to acute treatments of conditions, emergency surgeries, antibiotics for infections, etc. But there is a huge area where we're doing things very, very badly wrong. And that is around the management of these chronic diseases, which are they're contributing to the greatest cost of healthcare, both in the US and UK. Let's talk about sugar, which is <laughs> clearly something that you focus on a lot. When did you realize and, and what happened to make you focus so particularly on sugar when the message had always been about fat? Yes. Um, I think I'd, I'd started to realize initially that, that things weren't quite right around fat, partly because, you know, there's been this whole focus and obsession and still is, you know, this oversimplistic model that eating fat raises cholesterol, causes heart disease. And I realized there was something wrong with that. Well, that theory was flawed initially because I had a lot of patients who were significantly obese who had completely normal or low cholesterol levels, and they were under this false illusion that there was they were diet was healthy, and they were probably because they were following a low fat diet. That was one thing, and then I think the sugar epiphany, if you like, came to me initially when Professor Robert Lustig, who's a pediatrician in the University of California, San Francisco. He delivered a YouTube lecture and wrote a piece in Nature, commentary in Nature a few years ago, basically explaining that sugar, in his view, fulfilled criteria that meant it should be regulated like tobacco and alcohol. And I was fascinated by this. That kind of triggered my kind of interest uh, initially in sugar. And then I started looking up myself, research. But as, you know, as many of us do, Peter, once you look into this and someone who's, who's particularly health conscious myself, I reflected on my own diet and I realized I was eating a lot of sugar. And um, being always hungry and all that was was a norm for me. Well, we eat sugar without thinking about it. Absolutely. You know, it was typical. The sugar cereal in the morning, the orange juice, you know, I've always been... The healthy orange juice. The healthy orange juice. Supposedly. I've been a a keen sportsman throughout my kind of school and university days. Sports drinks. Uh, Absolutely. You know, I I used to play football, cricket, all that kind of stuff. Then I was running and, and, and this was a norm for me. And I would, you know, and... You know, I've never, never been particularly overweight, partly probably because of, of, of genetic, but I've, I've, had, I've had always had a bit of this kind of belly fat thing and I've never been able to shift it. So anyway, uh, the club. <laughs> uh, so, so I kind of cut the sugar out significantly and I just, I was amazed. My hunger wasn't the same as it used to be. I did lose a significant amount of weight around my waist, although it wasn't particularly for weight loss. I did it, I did it for my health reasons. But, you know, it's not anecdote is, is, is probably people say it's a, the, the lowest form of evidence. But, you know, we all in our own worlds and our lives, we're more influenced by things that we experience as individuals. Of course, right? that's more what motivates us individually. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. But, you know, I was doing it, looking at the evidence independently and thinking, OK, this makes sense to me. But I should practice what I preach once I realized I felt that this was the way to go. So that's where it kind of started off. And then what happened was I then became very alarmed because I looking at research and realizing from what I learned in medical school is that ultimately the the environment shapes our behavior more than we realize. And the food environment was saturated with sugar. I started going into supermarkets and looking at labels of, and I was like, sugar in everything. And the levels of sugar were really quite staggering. And, and when I looked at what the evidence, the scientific evidence told us when the harm started to, just from small amounts of sugar consumption, The actual dietary advice in the UK on the labelling, and I end up writing a piece in the BMJ about this, which created quite a news story in early 2013. That's the British Medical Journal. Yes, sorry, British Medical Journal. um, It was called The the Dietary Advice on on Sugar is in Need of Emergency Surgery. Because in effect, in the EU, the labelling on sugar was telling people, it very easily interpreted that you should be consuming, as part of your guideline daily amount, 22 and a half teaspoons of sugar a day. Which actually, if people do that, added sugar, they are very high risk of getting type 2 diabetes. So, And of course, this is where we become confused because already I'm visualizing that amount of, of sugar. And of course, we're not consuming sugar in spoonfuls. It is in the food. You can't see the amount, the physical amount of sugar that you are consuming. And you, you said earlier that you cut out sugar. 
well, how do you cut out sugar? Do you simply not eat those foods on the label that say added sugar, five grams of sugar or whatever? There's still sugar in lots of the items that we eat and we don't know how much is there. Peter, you're absolutely spot on. Uh, in fact, there's an interesting statistic in the States that about half of sugar consumption comes from foods that people don't normally think have sugar in them, which is things like bread and ketchup and salad dressings. About a third comes from sugary drinks and about six comes from things like people that they know is junk, you know, cookies and ice cream, etc. <laughs> and fruit. Yes. Fruit is good, but yeah. there's a lot of sugar in fruit. Yeah. I mean, the thing about fruit, what's interesting is um, it, because you have fiber within the fruit, the actual amount of sugar right. and the dose is, um, I'm just, I'm paraphrasing Robert Lustig here, you know, the dose determines the poison. So small amounts your body can metabolize and deal with, but we're not consuming it in small amounts. We're consuming it in quite large large quantities. Just to give you an example, in the UK, the average UK citizen, and this is probably an underestimate, is consuming two to three times what the World Health Organization now recommends should be a maximum limit of, of added sugar. So fruit, you're right. If people eat lots and lots of fruit, it probably could have an adverse effect on them. But in general, fruit isn't the issue, but certainly juices. And when you have juice, you know, if you think about it, you have to squeeze so many oranges, five or six oranges into right. a regular a regular um, glass of orange juice, and you've stripped out all the fiber, and literally you've just got liquid sugar. Well, these are, are the kind of distinctions that, that need to be made, and this is sure. the education process that we all need to go through to understand why sugar in your apple or your orange is probably okay in, in yes, moderation, as absolutely. opposed to the sugar isn't, all sugar isn't equal. Absolutely. Or right. at least the sources of the sugar. Absolutely. And I think the first thing is to deal with the added, the, re the very refined, pure sucrose or in high fructose corn syrup. So the fructose component, which is the added sugar bit, is, is likely to be, the evidence is telling us, is, is causing a lot of these or contributing significantly to many chronic diseases. So that's uh, a bit to cut out, really. And how does it do that? How does the fructose contribute to those diseases? So the mechanism is through insulin resistance. So this is basically when you consume too much sugar. And actually, the interesting thing is, Peter, this also re applies to refined carbohydrates as well, that what happens is it, it causes the liver to produce excess fat, and that contributes to what we call insulin resistance in the body. But it's very sim simply to think about it is what you're doing is you're causing with chronic consumption of, of sugar, you're basically spiking your glucose in the bloodstream to high levels, which causes insulin to increase to, to kind of bring the glucose down. And if you're doing this repeatedly to your body, then over time, your body develops something called insulin resistance. So it stops being able to deal with those excess glucose and, and the insulin, the cells don't respond as well. And then you get excess glucose in the body, which you get into the pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes state. And that is not just a type 2 diabetes. It's, it's likely insulin resistance is actually the root of many of these. You know, it's estimated probably 50% of high blood pressure is rooted in insulin resistance. Heart disease, the biggest risk factor, many people don't know this, for the development of heart disease is not high cholesterol, it's insulin resistance. You know, there is more research ongoing now that links insulin resistance to cancer. Insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, in a significant proportion of people, about 70% of people with type 2 diabetes will go into developed dementia. They are thinking of renaming Alzheimer's disease as type 3 diabetes. So a lot of these chronic diseases are rooted in insulin resistance, and sugar is one of those major culprits. So how easy is it to give up sugar? You say you did it, yeah. but... You don't just do it, presumably. You've got to really think about what you're doing. Yeah. Peter, it's, it's, for me, it was easier than I thought it would be because, you know, reflecting back, I mean, I probably since I was a child, I was consuming a lot of sugar for a period of at least, you know, 25 years or so before I started to, maybe longer, before I actually started to cut it out. And once I had, in my own mind, realized the harm that I was doing to my body, and, and it would affect me in my middle age, almost certainly, or concerns about that, then, you know, I conditioned my mind to say, okay, well, I need to cut this out and, and to see how I feel and what happened, what happens as a result. And actually, for me, it, I remember it didn't, you know, it was a couple of weeks. I mean, I, what I tell people as well, I mean, I speak to my patients about this as well, and, and, and friends and family members, is I did feel a bit of withdrawal. I remember getting a little bit of a headache and that kind of thing for a few days. But it, it didn't last very long. And after a few weeks of completely cutting out and going sort of cold turkey at the very beginning, completely cold turkey, then I found I didn't crave it as much anymore. In fact, significantly less. 
And, you know, I would eat foods that previously I wouldn't have noticed were sweet later on if I had the occasional kind of something with a little bit of sugar in it and found it quite sweet. And now I don't, you know, it's not, I don't feel this is punitive. I don't feel, you know, that I'm punishing myself by restricting sugar in my, in my life or my diet. I mean, I will still have an occasional bit of cake or, you know, whatever, and maybe a few days where I'll have a little bit of sugar in my diet. But I, I don't enjoy it the same way, which is interesting. I just don't feel as good. I don't feel the kind of, you know, it, it's interesting. My body seems to have adjusted. And, and obviously, I've replaced that with, with eating more fat as well. A lot of people can probably associate with giving up sugar in your tea or, or your coffee if you're something that uh, as you get older a lot of people actually naturally seem to want to do that you don't have to really work that hard at it but initially there might be some kickback from your body that it, it's not there but you very quickly get used to it and as yes. you say I used to take sugar in my coffee tea as a as a youngster but I don't know and the thought of it now it's just the thought of it of yeah. that sweet taste yeah is awful yeah uh, I'm the same Peter I'm absolutely the same there is that kind of slightly sickly, you know, you just, and when I've gone again, I've thought, okay, let me have a bit of an indulgence here. I just haven't felt good <laughs> for the hours after I've, I've indulged myself in a, a chocolate cake or whatever else. So I think that's kind of helped. And of course, the thing that we're all fighting about when you're talking about giving sugar up at the scale that, that you have done and, and that perhaps a lot of people should do, what we're fighting against is the images of sugar that yeah. we see all around us, yes. whether it's on billboards or on television or just other people around us saying, have some of this, have some of the office cake. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's an extra layer of, of competition there, isn't there? It's, yeah. not, it's not just your body wanting no. the sugar and initially. The, yeah. It's other people seemingly wanting you to have sugar. Yeah, no, you're right. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad you raised that point because that brings us on to, you know, the biggest impact in terms of our behaviours is, 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 is the environment. And when it comes to the food environment, that is the major issue. If we're going to overcome this problem on a population level, then it needs a population intervention. And that means certainly reducing the amount of the availability of sugar in the environment. And there's a very eminent science, behavioral scientist in the University of Cambridge called Teresa Marteau. And she says that food choices are also more often than not automatic and made without full conscious awareness. So, you know, someone who's wishing to lose weight is still tempted to buy that very brightly pa packaged chocolate bar at the checkout till. You know, we call it candy at the cash register. And that brings us on to another area of how, you know, the industry know where they place products, how they market them. They've done a lot of research and there's a science behind what's going to influence and impact on people's eating behavior. But they then come out with the argument when we try and regulate or we call for regulation is, oh, this is a nanny statism. It's about personal responsibility. So they've used that very well. And certainly in, in countries in the Western world and countries like the United States, that's a, it's a very powerful a form of propaganda, if you like. I mean, listen, I'm all for personal responsibility, but let's define what personal responsibility is. You need to have knowledge and information, and you need to have choice. And we actually have neither. If most food in the supermarket has added sugar, or there are less healthy choices available, and then the information where people are not told that actually this is significantly damaging your health. So that argument doesn't stand up in so my view. trying to, to fight against the industries that are throwing sugar at us isn't the way forward. You would say it's more at a, an everyman education level to promote individual responsibility and see a maybe slower but maybe longer lasting progress in that respect. Yeah, well, actually, Peter, I, I mean, I very much campaigned and lobbied for regulation, to be honest. I think we have a healthcare crisis in the Western world, whether it's in obesity or associated diseases. And, you know, and these diseases also affect significant amount of people who have a normal body mass index. And as I pointed out in the film, The Big Fat Fix, there is no such thing as a healthy weight. We're all vulnerable to these toxins, if you like, in the environment, food environment. But it needs regulation. And I, but I think it needs, it needs, you know, we need to basically it needs to be a multifaceted approach to get the education to the public, you know. But also the public needs to, you know, this is this is a gross injustice as well. Uh, and part of what I've been doing is, um, and, and that drives me, my passion, is making that injustice visible. The injustice around the misinformation on diet and health. The injustice around how the industry is able to lobby politicians to stop regulation happening that's going to help people's health in a very short space of time and reduce the burden on healthcare. And it's about, you're, you're absolutely right, making the, but educating the public and also making, you know, people are people are angry. You know, people are angry when they realize they've been misled and their health has been affected and they may have lost loved ones prematurely because of... And those people who have actually 
tried to and wanted to follow a healthy lifestyle, but actually have been doing something that is ultimately going to has been has, has harmed them. You, know? you mentioned your film, The Big Fat Fix. <laughs> Before, let's talk about that. Uh, but let's maybe go back a little bit. And uh, I referred to my lifestyle or my attitudes as a youngster, and when I did take sugar. And this was at a time, this is, let's say, the 1970s, 1980s, when a lot of people were talking about fat and calories and low-fat diets and margarine was the great saviour of uh, future health. And attitudes were very, very different, but very misplaced, weren't they? Yeah, completely. And understandably so, when you go back to sort of the 50s, 60s, 70s, there was major concerns in the US and the UK about the increase in uh, heart disease and cardiovascular death. And, you know, there were uh, solutions offered from, from various quarters. I think we've realized now that actually the biggest culprit was tobacco, was smoking. But at the time, the science was still emerging. Uh, the tobacco industry did a, you know, were very cunning because they were able to stall any regulation on on smoking for about a good five decades from when the first studies came out linking smoking and lung cancer because they adopted what what I call a corporate playbook, which was denying that smoking caused lung cancer or nicotine was addictive, plant therefore planting doubt, confusing the public. And for me as a doctor, the the worst part was even buying the loyalty of scientists. So there were people who were on the payroll of the tobacco industry, eminent scientists that would, you know, write articles in journals saying, well, they didn't think it was linked to cancer, etc, or heart disease. And they did that very effectively for a long time. And what happened with fat is I think with all the best intentions, you know, uh, many scientists basically linked fat consumption to so called clogging the arteries. It's an easy concept for people to understand. It makes sense. And we can go into a little bit around that. But Actually, that was fatally flawed. And as a result, then people's consumption of the low-fat food movement started. And we've seen in the States and in the UK that the actual percentages of refined carbohydrates and sugar increased significantly. And although death rates from heart disease dropped, it's still the biggest killer in the Western world. And the, the death rates dropped because of smoking, not because we reduced our fat consumption. And that's quite clear now. The evidence is quite clear on that. So we've got to wind back from those harms and also learn from history we need to question medical science more and not just accept it. You know, things will still continue to evolve even now, but we need to keep, you know, keep questioning things uh, more well, than do, we do. It, it does just show how readily we believe things yes. w- when we are told them by doctors or by advertisers. The, the yeah. message seems to stick very quickly. Yes. If ultimately the result is that we'll be healthier, magically we'll be healthier yeah. because we, we do this. And as you say, we've got a question and question and question and, and yeah. history is showing and, and, and short term history is showing that so often we could be wrong. Especially when there are huge commercial influences behind all of this. And, that, and that's been another, you know, science evolves, people get things wrong or they may be partially right. And then you need to just evolve that particular theory in a, in a better or more nuanced way, which is actually more important, which, which is more impactful for specific individuals. But, you know, we, we take things further. But the problem happens is what, what, what I've realized is that certainly when it comes to the cholesterol and fat message, you know, there, it was flawed science, but then there were commercial interests that made a lot of money. There, I mean, there are still people that make a lot of money, big industries that profit from the wrong message, from the message that's actually harming people. And it, that doesn't, you know, that can't be overturned overnight. But we have to. We have to do it quickly. We have to change things. And we have to call those industries out. So they also change their... We, we live in a commercial capitalist world. And, you know, people uh, will always want to will want to make money. And, and there are big industries behind it. But we need to change to something that actually is going to benefit people's health. And we're, yeah, we're not doing that right now. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's talk about the film then, The Big Fat Fix. What did you set out to achieve with this film? You went on a, on a journey, didn't you? Yeah, it was a journey of discovery actually for me. So um, I collaborated with a former Irish international athlete called Donal O'Neill, who'd made a couple of excellent documentaries that I'd seen. Um, his first one was called Serial Killers. 
and the second one was called Run on Fat. And it was very much very similar themes around, you know, the dietary advice being wrong. And, and you know, he, he, he did a really good job with those. And we met uh, after I spoke at a conference in Cape Town and he was actually screening his second documentary there. And we started chatting and he'd followed a lot of my work and, you know, we discussed doing a, a film together around the Mediterranean diet. So where does this come from? Because everybody, when they think about healthy diet, they think Mediterranean diet, but the actual interpretation of it actually was was wrong. Um, so uh, what, yeah, what, yeah, what does that actually mean? It, it's well, a exactly. catchphrase almost that's just thrown out. Yeah, absolutely. So what we wanted to do is the first and foremost is, you know, combine what we knew about the modern medical independent research that I had interpreted and looked at over several years and written about and go to the actual origins of where the American scientist that was probably the most influential and powerful man in nutrition, Ansel Keys, um, almost single-handedly responsible for changing dietary guidelines in the US in 77 and the UK in 83, behind the low-fat message, where he spent most of his time doing research. And this was in a tiny Italian village called Piopi, which is south of Naples. And for me, it was fascinating, Peter, because you know when we actually went there to make the documentary, we didn't actually know what we were going to find other than we knew that this village had a population of about 200 people. Their average life expectancy is still very good. It's around 90, both for men and women. So we wanted to see what, how are these people living and how does that fit in to the modern medical research? And could we kind of find a middle ground here that kind of made sense? And, you know, one of the things that we discovered, and I, I was there just for a week, but one thing I felt on a personal level, I remember my stress level was dropping very quickly as soon as I was there because it's a beautiful environment. You know, it's on the coast. Um, there's a very strong sense of community there. Um, they're very friendly. And, you know, they're not not particularly affluent place. But there were a combination of factors. And we spoke to the local mayor as well. And he explained to us that, you know, the diet, and when people see the film, they realize that actually the word diet you know, from ancient Greek actually means lifestyle. It wasn't just diet. So it was it was everything. It was, it was a food. It was a culture. It was a landscape. It was social interaction. It was less stress. It was the fact that they were outside a lot and moving. There were no gyms in this place. And it wasn't just about living to old age, Peter. I think there's another crucial aspect of this. It's about aging well and aging healthily. And I remember that the local restaurant we'd go and eat in, the manager stroke waiter, who was very agile and active, uh, was 85 years old. 85, you know. So, you know, we spoke to people there. Uh, we spoke to people that knew Ansel Keys. And, uh, and Ansel Keys lived to be 100, I think, didn't he? He actually lived to be 100. Which, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. He did live to, live to 100. So um, practice what he preached then, obviously. Yeah, I think so. But actually, you know, I think he realized as well later on in his career, and we talk about that in the film a little bit, that the whole cholesterol thing had gone off the tracks a little bit. Right. It wasn't as important as people, you know, as he certainly thought it was at the beginning. And also the relationships of food and cholesterol, et cetera, also was, was flawed. Um, Maybe we should just explain that if we can then. Why is our understanding of, of cholesterol flawed? And yeah. I'm talking about dietary cholesterol, the, the yeah. cholesterol that we see on, on the label and that, yeah. how that relates to how our body functions. So the first thing is dietary cholesterol, which is things that are found in like egg yolks, for example, or cheese, doesn't influence blood cholesterol. But what the message, the main message had been for a long time is that saturated fat, which is, you know, what is found in things like butter and cheese and meat, for example, at high levels, causes raised cholesterol in the bloodstream. And it does impact and it influences cholesterol in, in, in individuals in various ways. But the traditional hypothesis is it raises your LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, and total cholesterol, which is built up of, of different sort of particles, and high cholesterol causes heart disease. What's interesting is, there's a couple of things. One is saturated fat can raise your LDL, but it also raises HDL, the good cholesterol. And when we as doctors or cardiologists calculate someone's risk, it's not total cholesterol that is the um, the sort of called risk factor for heart disease. It's what we call total cholesterol divided by your HDL ratio. So what actually happens when people certainly reduce sugar, which also raises, affects things like triglycerides in the bloodstream, which are also another type of cholesterol, that actually it doesn't ultimately have an adverse effect, providing, especially if you reduce your refined carbohydrates and sugar. So that's one thing. The second thing is cholesterol itself as a risk factor has been grossly exaggerated. So I was actually involved in some research that was published last year where we looked at data. It was the first time this was done specifically at people over the age of 60. And most people who suffer heart disease and heart attacks are over 60. 
And what we looked at was, was there an association between the so-called bad cholesterol, LDL, and heart disease? And what about more to overall death as well? Because people die of lots of other conditions other than heart disease. And what was fascinating is if you're over 60, that for the overwhelming majority of people, LDL cholesterol is not associated with heart disease and was inversely associated with death. Now, the explanation for the inverse association with death was actually based around the fact that cholesterol is a very vital molecule in the body. It's needed for hormone production, but it's also involved in the immune system. And um, there is some data suggests that it protects against people getting things like pneumonia and gastrointestinal infections, which in the elderly, obviously, it, it, you know, if you get pneumonia and you're old, you know, the, your, the mortality rate is very high. So that, that I think, was, was fascinating. So we've exaggerated cholesterol as a risk factor for heart disease. The conventional theory on saturated fat causing raised cholesterol and that causing heart disease is, is fundamentally flawed. And modern med science has now shown us, I mean, there was a very extensive research done by Cambridge researchers in, published in 2014 in one of the major medical journals that showed that they couldn't find this association between saturated fat and heart disease as well. So, you know, this is, this is an evolving area, but there's still, I'm sure there are people listening to this now who will be sitting there thinking, wow, you know, they're avoiding all these saturated fat, you know, foods because they just have this thing in their mind. And, you know, you talked about these beliefs, Peter, that people have. We st people still think saturated fat, clogged arteries, heart attack, death. It's complete and total nonsense. Yeah, and, and the problem is for a lot of people, it is so difficult to let go of those beliefs. They, they've been brought up with them. Parents have passed them on to their children and they just can't accept that what they've lived with for decades yeah. could possibly be wrong. Peter, and the same applies to scientists who have built their careers on this hypothesis, if you like, or certainly, you know, taught, been taught this and teach people this. And for them, it's difficult. You know, it's very difficult for people to, uh, certainly scientists, to, to admit we're, you know, things have, we've got things wrong, we need to change. And it's very difficult for us as human beings sometimes to do that. But we need to do that because it is fatally flawed. And that message does, is causing harm as well, indirectly. So you went on this journey for the documentary. You went to Italy. And by the way, the community that you describe where there aren't that many gyms, it's, it's a lifestyle, it's a, it's a low pressure kind of lifestyle that people seem to be very happy, that they work hard, but they eat well. Yes. They enjoy their red wine and they enjoy good foods, good freshly made foods. I think that lesson is getting through because that's not the only place in the world that's like that. I mean, there's a city just outside of Los Angeles called Loma Linda. It's a Seventh-day Adventist community, and they are mostly, not exclusively, but mostly vegetarians, a lot of vegans. Some will eat meat. Um, not that many gyms. There are gyms there, but people live a, a relaxed kind of lifestyle. They take their, as part of their religion, their Saturdays just to let go a little bit, to relax, to get away from their technology, get away from work, and to be with their family. And it's the whole picture. It's everything that goes into the lifestyle. People in Loma Linda live, on average, about 10 years longer than the rest of America, indeed the rest of the, of the Western world probably akin to the kind of lifestyles that people are living in those Italian communities. I think we need to learn from that, don't we? Yeah, fascinating, Peter. That's fascinating. Um, absolutely, yes. It has to be a holistic approach. You know, there are, you know, it's interesting we talk about the commercial influences. There are kind of silos and lobbyists within. You've got the exercise industry, you know, you've got diets and, and food industry. But actually, we need to combine all of these things. And, it, and, and that's actually the secret of these communities that, that live well is, you know, and the, you know, the social interaction is so important. Social isolation, especially as you get older, is a big risk factor for premature death and depression. So even we talk even mental health. You know, and mental health is very strongly linked to physical health as well. So we have to change the culture and the mindset and combine all these things and, you know, get, pe you know, what happens to the British lunch hour? What happened to sitting with people having lunch? We need to start incorporating that back into our lives because we'll be happier because of it as well. It's not just about, you know, there are people that may argue, you know, they like to indulge in there, whether it's smoking or drinking to excess or indulging in junk food. But actually, this is about collective happiness, individual and collective happiness more than anything else. That is going to be linked to better health. So I was about to say, and I digressed myself, um, <laughs> when you went on your journey with your documentary, and were you looking for a fix? And did you come away with a, a conclusion with a fix? Yes, definitely. Absolutely. And it was all these things. You know, I, I myself, I was quite stressed 
up to going in and I've had a lot of stress, you know, partly with different things going on and working and, and campaigning and writing, you know, so all these things, it, t- it takes its toll. Mm. You can be overcommitted, as you probably know, Peter, we in your profession. We stress on ourselves. We do, we, we do. Yes. But, but just for me personally, having that, you know, just feeling it viscerally, thinking, you know, wow. And, and even I've been over here for a few weeks. I'm staying with, with family in, in California and uh, just being with people that you, you care about and who care about you. And uh, that is, is so important just to even, you know, sleeping better. I mean, sleep's another issue as well. You know, we, I think that there is some good data showing that on average we're sleeping less than we used to. And that's also, you know, a good sleep is so important for, for everything else that we're doing. It's all linked to the stress. So I think we need to concentrate on all these things at once. And, you know, some of it will get through, some of it won't, but it will definitely improve your health. And, and very quickly, it's never too late. On the stress issue, there was a very interesting paper published in Nature as well called Too Toxic to Ignore, if I remember the title correctly. And there was some interesting data on that showing that even in middle age, within months of people adopting a reduced stress, whether it's yoga or you know eating better and, and exercising better, that this can actually influence genes that control the aging process. So in effect, you know, potentially slow down the aging process, even in middle age, if you know, you're a busy executive or stress person or... It's never too late, and and these lifestyle changes can have an impact on your health very quickly. And actually, that brings me to precisely the takeaway, or one of the takeaways from your documentary, The Die Hard. And that was a very simple advice that you gave in terms of consumption of extra virgin olive oil on, <laughs> yeah. a, on a daily basis. So just explain what your theory there yeah, is. Yeah, so there, there is a quite a lot of clinical uh, sort of data and trials that have been done on the extra virgin olive oil. And the mechanism of benefit is thought to, to be through anti-inflammatory properties, and specifically with heart disease, which is a, an inflammatory condition not caused by fat, but it's a chronic inflammatory condition that causes the, the furring up of these arteries, if you like, which then leads to a heart attack. And there was a study called the PREDIMED study, which is a Spanish government funded, a Spanish what we call randomized control trial. So kind of the best quality evidence to try and show cause and effect. And what they found is that people who consumed at least four, middle aged people who consumed at least four tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil per day, or a handful of nuts, were significantly less likely to suffer heart attack, stroke or death specifically reduction in stroke. But what was interesting was the comparative diet was still quite a healthy diet. So what the point I'm making here is that the benefits of that, if it were compared to the average Western diet, probably would have been even stronger. So, and and again, in Piopi, this was, you know, and in a lot of the Mediterranean regions, extra virgin olive oil is, is just, is a staple. So I, you know, I try and consume quite a lot of extra virgin olive oil and it's, it it is the best fat. Your base fat should be olive oil. And what, what does the extra virgin mean again? Well, the extra virgin means it's less refined. So you basically get a higher polyphenol content within the olive oil. And the polyphenols are these compounds that are thought to have an anti-inflammatory effect on, on the body and, and on, on blood vessels, basically. So that's why you want to go for the best quality least refined olive oil that you can get hold on mm, fascinating and your film your documentary is being turned into a book yes so we've um just signed a, a deal with penguin and we will be producing a, a book version of the movie to kind of give people a manual and tools whether it's diet exercise etc for their health that this can be you know it's kind of a if you like a 21 day plan that within those 21 days and there's good research to support this that you can significantly impact on your health and and change it for the better i think that was the other message that uh, precisely as you say that you can change things even in middle or old age you can change things pretty quickly absolutely absolutely and you know uh, peter i treat many patients i mean my career i've treated thousands of people with heart disease and i have patients coming to me all the time that are amazed you know, people even, I would say, you could you say reverse, certainly send into remission their type 2 diabetes, people coming off their medications simply from cutting out refined carbohydrates within weeks to months. I wrote an article in Telegraph newspaper about a patient I saw who was a lady who basically in middle age had basically been on insulin for type 2 diabetes for many years. And her do- it was interesting, her daughter, who was a surgeon, had read basically about, you know, all the, the stuff that I'd been doing and, and be involved in around carbohydrates and type 2 diabetes. And, and basically, she this, this lady switched her rice and bread that she was eating a lot of to more butter and cheese, basically cut out the refined carbs from her diet and, and was able to come off insulin for the first time in 17 years, which is extraordinary. So the impact of, of these lifestyle changes are, you know, more powerful than any drug, Peter, 
Um, mm. Yet there are, you know, there's a huge industry around uh, type two diabetes drugs, which, you know, sadly don't impact on what we call the what we call the hard endpoints in terms of health outcomes, in terms of death, heart attack, and stroke. Most of these drugs have absolutely no benefit. And the sad part of all of this is that patients are not even told that. I'm not against these drugs having some effect, and you know there is certainly going to be some benefit, but in terms of not really affecting their longevity, whereas we have got data showing lifestyle changes will and without side effects. So this is about getting that information out there as well. How much do you think longevity and, and people thinking about their longevity, to what extent is that an incentive to people to do something? Do people, I do a lot, but do people generally think that long term? Or for most people, is it about the here and now and how I feel today? And maybe for, for many more importantly, how I look today, because we're talking about obesity, something that the vast majority of people simply don't want because they don't want to feel like that, they don't want to look like that, and they know it's bad for their health today. But do you think of your longevity? Yeah, yeah. I think it's both, Peter. I think it's about feeling healthy and happy in the moment, but wanting to sustain that for a long, as long as possible. I think most of us think that way. In fact, there's, uh, I wrote a piece in The Observer about a very interesting health survey that was done. And in terms of what people prioritize in their personal lives more than anything else, number one was health, followed by a happy family environment as number two, which I thought was fascinating. So I think most of us actually do. Uh, I personally, yeah, I'd like to feel good in the moment, but in a more sustainable way. And also having the realization that, you know, the, the kind of hedonistic eating, you might feel good for a few minutes if you scoff down that burger and fries when you're hungry, and it gives you that kind of, you do get a high from it. People get high from eating food. Um, but can you get high from eating food that's healthy as well? And I think you can. But I think the more that you adopt the kind of lifestyle that you're talking about, the kind of dietary lifestyle especially, the more you realize that you have that burger and fries and you might feel great in, in, the, in the precise moment. But just two hours later, three hours later, you're not going to feel great. No. And then people actually get into a cycle where they then, you know, it's almost like the drug, isn't it? It's like they'll have some cookies or something else or something sugary, you know. And I was there so I can empathize with people because I, I was that guy. I think we've all been that guy. I mean, <laughs> yeah. to some extent, I'm, I'm still that guy. It's, it's, it's a constant journey. I mean, you've yeah. been on this educational journey. But at an individual level, you're constantly learning and changing. At least I do. I change my attitude according to hopefully what I'm reading in terms of, of solid science. Yeah, absolutely. But also to add that the, you know you can still get that high from nutritious food. That's the other aspect to all of this. Again, it's not being about being punitive. You know, we need to turn those healthy foods also into uh, making people understand that it can be very palatable. And you know, so you're eating something that's that's nourishing your body. It's good for your health. You're enjoying it. What more does somebody want? And do you have, and I often ask this question to people, people like you, do you have a, an attitude towards your own personal? longevity. And clearly you are doing a lot. You think intensely about your diet and your exercise and your lifestyle. What are your personal goals? I, I am very conscious about my health. And actually, I found when I was doing the research on this and looking all these other things about, you know, I feel good when I do exercise. I feel good when I eat good food. I feel good when I'm interacting socially and having a, an interesting, stimulating conversation with someone. So, you know, my personal goals are, I, I think, are no different to anyone else's. And again, it's been an evolutionary process for me. And I also accept, you know, this is not a, you know, and, and, and we'll point this out in the book that, you know, one size doesn't fit all, but there are certain commonalities. But we've got the commonalities wrong. So let's get all of, let's get that right first. And then, of course, there's going to be some nuances and a bit of tweaking here and there for individuals that they will then find themselves when they go on this journey. And hopefully when they read the book and they change their lifestyle, they will be able to think, wow, you know, this has had a big impact on my health. And for me personally, Peter, you know, this is about you know, when I started this journey, I had a goal in the next five or ten years that I want to witness the news headlines are obesity's down, heart disease is down, type 2 diabetes is down, people are happier in the National Health Service, doctors can work in a service and treat patients who really need that treatment. We're not over-medicating a population of healthy people with drugs that aren't benefiting them and are only going to cause them harm. These are my goals that I want to contribute to trying and to see that because ultimately as well, and it comes back I don't think we can be truly individually happy unless society is collectively happy. I feel that. I feel mm. that as a doctor working in the NHS. I feel that when I walk down the street. And that's what I want to see. 
in the next few years. Well, it's a two-way relationship, isn't it, between how society feels and yeah. how you feel at an individual level. Absolutely. And it needs government buy-in. And, you know, we when we when uh, uh, there was a reason that when we this film originally premiered in the British Parliament, it was hosted as screening in British Parliament. It then went to the European Parliament. And, you know, it's nice to influence the influencers because ultimately, Peter, without buy-in from politicians... We're not going to get this; these population changes done. And just briefly, you made this film, you funded this film through crowdsourcing, and, and there was a reason for that. Yeah, I mean, one of the messages is that I wanted to keep it as clean as possible and free from commercial influence, so it wasn't about, you know, we didn't want any sort of branding or that kind of thing, and the message was, was to keep it simple. So, yeah, we did, we did it through Kickstarter and through social media, basically. We managed to raise the funds to make the film, which... Um, the first stage was doing that, and uh, and, and that was great. It, you know, it's a film for the public, funded by the public, if you like. How can people see the film right now? Is it available online? Yes, yeah, so you can download it um, by going to thebigfatfix.com. And, uh, you know, it's about $5, basically, to download, or you can own it. And what we want to do, actually, with this, ultimately, Peter, is, you know, take it around the world. We want to, you know, raise enough money so we can get it dubbed into various languages and I'm sure once the book comes out as well probably in combination you know my aim is to take it to Australia I'm very much hoping that you know we'll get pick up here as well in the states more pick up and hit the uh, the American public if we can with the messaging uh, and I think people find it, it's not just about you know the health I think people will find it interesting and entertaining it is interesting it is entertaining <laughs> as well we see you going on your own personal journey working out in the woods with exercises that I couldn't possibly imagine but they seem to do you a lot of good it, it is educational I'm glad you're bringing out the book as well because there is a lot of information in there that you simply cannot absorb on a first watching of a film. Sure. And we, you do at an individual level, I think, need to sit down and say, OK, there's the, the 10 bullet points that apply to me. Let's try to act on those. Absolutely. So I think as a package, that's why it's good. I want this book to be a kind of manual for health revolution. That's, that's my aim. I wish you all the best with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> And if you want to find out more about Dr. Asim Malhotra's work, he's online at drasim.com. Now, if you're considering a new diet or workout, you should always consult your own doctor first. This podcast does not provide medical advice, although hopefully our discussion has provided some food for thought. Well, that's it for episode three. Thanks for listening. Our website is llamapodcast.com and we're on Facebook and Twitter at Llama Podcast. Podcast.